of Good Morning on this third Sunday of Advent. And um, I'm going to begin by uh, reading the collect for today. O Lord Jesus Christ, who at your first coming sent your messenger to prepare your way before you. Grant that the ministers and stewards of your mysteries may likewise so prepare and make ready your way by turning the hearts of the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, that at your second coming to judge the world we may be found and an acceptable people in your sight. For you are alive and reign with the Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Traditionally on this uh, third Sunday of Advent, a focus is given to John the Baptist. That's why we're going to have two readings. The first is um, from the prophet Zephaniah, on whom I'm going to be preaching in a moment. And then the second, the gospel reading, will be a focus on John the Baptist. So from Zephaniah chapter 3 verses 14 to the end of the chapter. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment he has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands be limp. Hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. The sorrows for the appointed feasts I will remove from you. You are a burden and reproach. They are a burden and reproach to you. At that time I will deal with all who oppressed you. I will rescue the lame and gather those who have been scattered. I will give them praise and honour in every land where they were put to shame. At that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. I will give you honour and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. And the Gospel New Testament reading is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 3, beginning at verse 7. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptised by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that... Out of these stones, God can raise up children to Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? The crowd asked. Jesus, um, John answered, The man with two tunics should share with him who has none, and the one who has food should do the same. Tax collectors also came to be baptised. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ. John answered them all, 
I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hands to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and preached the good news to them. Let's pray together. Father, I pray now that as we look at this passage from Zephaniah, you may speak afresh to us to challenge us, to encourage us and to inspire us with the good news that we celebrate at this time of year. In Christ's name. Amen. Well, in the lectionary this morning, there were a few choices to be made. And um, I could choose, have choose, chosen between Zephaniah and Philippians, Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. I chose the Zephaniah passage to preach on. I love the Philippians one. It's probably one of my favourite uh, New Testament passages to preach on. So do have a look at that if you want to. But it just seems to me at this time of year, we get an opportunity to look at um, some of perhaps the more obscure parts of the Old Testament and see their relevance to us today. I'm sure not many of us have read um, Zephaniah, or not recently. And um, Zephaniah is only a short, um, one of the short prophets, it's only three chapters, take you a quarter of an hour, perhaps 20 minutes to read. It's well worth reading in one go. But um, we're going to be focusing on those latter verses um, that we heard from chapter chapter three in a moment. It's really valuable looking at these powerful prophecies that were there and recorded for a purpose. Zephaniah, he was writing at a dark time in the history of Israel. He was a contemporary of Jeremiah, if that helps you set him in, in context writing just before the exile. In fact, good things were beginning to happen and um, the book of the law had been discovered. J Josiah, King Josiah, one of the true, genuinely good kings, so you're quite a rare thing in those days, but he, Jer Josiah was beginning to try to implement some of these changes that he saw in the book of the law which had been discovered and to sort of put right all the wrongs that were being done in the temple and and so on a light was beginning to shine Zephaniah's prophecy begins with gloom and doom the headings of the new international version say it all warning of coming destruction against Judah against Philistia, against Moab and Ammon, against Cush and against Assyria. And in the third and final chapter, we see it's entitled The Future of Jerusalem. <laughs> and that's not good either. Verses one and two of chapter three say, woe to the city of oppressors, rebellious and defiled. She obeys no one, she accepts no correction, she does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. And despite all this negativity, however, there are sort of glimpses of light in the prophecy. For example, in verse 5 of this chapter 3, the Lord within her, within Jerusalem, is righteous. He does no wrong. And then verse 12, but I will leave within you the meek and humble, who trust in the name of the Lord. So even now, God is saying those who are faithful will be protected. God's protection is always there. And that's something well worth remembering, isn't it, in today's world. We can look at our world today and think how chaotic, how, 
how awful things are, and yet God is still God. And he will hold on to those who are faithful to him. Justice will be done. The other reason Old Testament passages like um, Zephaniah and many of the other passages in the Old Testament prophets and others are so wonderful is that they point to Jesus. They point to something wonderful to come. Just listen to verses 14 onwards. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. But <laughs> that didn't happen. That isn't how it was, at least certainly not um, in Zephaniah's day or in the years that immediately followed. 35 years later, Jerusalem and its temple would lie in ruins and the people of God exiled to Babylon. Yes, of course they returned. The temple would be rebuilt under Ezra. The walls of the city would be rebuilt under Nehemiah. But the temple would be a poor imitation of that first Solomon's temple. Just listen, when the, um, the people... Uh, saw the foundation of the new temple, the second temple as it's known, after the exile being started. Just listen to what we read in Ezra 3, verse 12. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of the temple being laid, while others shouted for joy. You see, there were those who remembered the glory of that first temple and so that this doesn't compare with that. And then, of course, we know that subsequently, between the Testaments, as it were, after our Old Testament and before the New Testament, when we know that the temple was desecrated by Antiochus IV Epiphanes, as he came to be known in AD 168 or 167, sorry, in BC, before Christ. An abomination that resulted in the Maccabean result. Ultimately, of course, that's, there's a celebration of Hanukkah which comes out of that when the temple, the second temple, was rededicated. But the damage that had been done by Antiochus wasn't the end. It might be felt that things looked up a bit at the time of Jesus. Herod the Great had certainly produced a wonderful temple building by that time. We know that from the awestruck comments of the disciples recorded in Mark's Gospel. And as Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings! To which Jesus replied, do you see all these buildings? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. And we, of course, know that exactly what Jesus said and predicted happened in AD 70 when the Romans came in. They destroyed Jerusalem then. They destroyed the temple. And to this day, all that remains is that temple mount with the Western Wall, which is sometimes called the Wailing Wall, the only remnant of the temple that there is to this day. That's all there is. So the prophecy here in Zephaniah appears unfulfilled right up to the present time which we are living in. 
Though, of course, we do see something in the remarkable coming of Jesus. Somehow Jesus, in Jesus, the damage done to the world by evil has begun to be undone. And that's really the story of the New Testament. That's what it's all about. God was starting in Jesus a new thing. The Bible strikingly ends with a description of the new heavens and the new earth and a new Jerusalem. Zephaniah foresaw a lot of the qualities of this new Jerusalem. Twice we read in these verses, the Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. And that's in verse 15. In verse 17, the Lord your God is with you. And of course, in Revelation 21, where we hear about the new Jerusalem, we, hear, we read this. And I heard a loud voice, that is an authoritative voice, from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he will dwell with them, they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. God is with you. And the Bible teaches us that that process of being with us has now begun. No one in their right mind would say that it's been completed. We just have to look around the world and see that we're still in a terrible mess. But Jesus had the nickname Emmanuel, given to him by the prophet Isaiah many years before, God with us. And I'm going to say more of that on my, um, in my sermon, in my talk, in the All Age talk on Christmas Day at 10 o'clock on Christmas Day, if you can make it to church. I don't think that's going to be recorded, so you may have to... Um, Come, if you wish to hear that. Verse 16 here says, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. I guess many of us find the prospect of standing one day before Jesus a little daunting. I take comfort from the fact that he already knows all about me. There's not going to be any revelations to him on that day. I remember Adrian Plass, the Christian writer, um, wrote many humorous books and some quite serious books too, but well worth reading, or always well worth reading. But I do remember hearing him once say that for him, a real change in his thinking took place when he realized that not only did God love him, but also he liked him. And isn't that really what verse 17 here says? And this is what I'm going to end with. I'll just leave you to ponder these remarkable words in the prophet Zephaniah. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Father, what a wonderful vision that is, that you rejoice over us. Help us to come to you with open hearts and minds, looking forward to that day when we meet you face to face. Amen. Do please join with me in um, the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And let's end by blessing one another 
in the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and always.